Lord. I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Dr. David Jeroge Evans. I'm the Bishop of Christian Life Church. We are based in Thika. Today I want to speak about um, the church from the book of Matthew. Like you have known, I'm consistently on the book of Matthew. Matthew is a book that was written around 60 AD and the theme of writing the book of Matthew is Jesus, the Messianic King, because uh, he wanted to prove to the Jews that this Jesus is the Messiah. I want to go straight to chapter 16 of the book of Matthew uh, on a point that uh, the Jews demanded for a sign. And I want to major on a few verses, like verse 6 and verse number 18. Uh, this is a scripture that speaks about, especially verse 1 to 4, about a theological sound. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. Verse number two says, he replied, when evening comes, you say it will be fair, or it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy, for the day is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. From there, you find that verse number five speaks about the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It says, when they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus told, Jesus said to them, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Uh, in this context, here yeast is a symbol of evil and corruption that refers to the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Christ calls their teaching yeast because even a small amount can, can penetrate and influence a large group of people to believe the wrong things. If you look at a reference from Mark chapter 8 verse 15, because we need to do a selected related scriptures or cross reference because you cannot found a doctrine from a single verse. In Mark chapter 8 and verse number 15, here the Bible says, let's begin from 14, it says, the disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. We are coming back to the word yeast. In the New Testament, yeast is usually a symbol, a symbol for evil or corruption. You can get that from Mark and Matthew and also John. If you look at Matthew 13, verse 33, and Matthew 16, verse 6, and verse number 11, and also from the book of Luke, chapter number 12, verse 1, you'll find Jesus speaking about the yeast in the cross-reference. And this yeast that is mentioned here is a small amount of yeast that will ferment and affect the whole. There are two or three points that we can talk about yeast, like we have said yeast, 
as the symbol for evil that is prevalent and corruption like we are seeing in our world of today. The yeast of the Pharisees refers to uh, their religious conditions, their religious traditions by which they set aside God's righteous commands or God's righteous standards and invalidated portions of his word and will. If you look at Mark chapter 7 verse 5 to 8, chapter 7 verse 5 to 8, this is how the Bible says, says this, verse number 5, and I read, So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders, instead of eating their food with unclean hands? He replied, As I was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You see, these are people who love uh, traditions. If you look at that, their hearts are far from, from Jesus. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were guilty of the sin of legalism. They were legalistics. A legalist substitutes outward acts or words for proper inner attitude that come from being born of God and the Spirit. You can find that from Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. And uh, such people honor God with their lips. They give lip service while their hearts are far from him. They appear righteous outwardly, uh, but inwardly have no real love for God. When we talk about legalists, what we are saying, legalism does not refer to, to the mere existence of laws, but legalists are people who want to live a Christian life and without any law. So they don't regard what the word of God says, what they regard is traditions of men. If you look at verse number 8, it says that they love the traditions of men. Pharisees and the teachers of the law are guilty of placing human tradition above divine revelation. And Jesus is condemning all traditions here. He is not condemning all traditions because he also uh, looked upon traditions like when he went for, for Pentecost uh, as the traditions when he looked at the rules that were there during the Pentecost because it was a tradition of the Jews. So what we are saying is that uh, we need to understand the concept of what yeast is all about. And so Jesus spoke this in Matthew 16 verse 18 says, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I would build my church, and the gates of heads will not overcome it. You know, when he's talking about Peter, remember Peter's name was Simon. Simon means unsettled reeds, but in the school of Jesus, he became like a rock. Uh, the word of God calls him Petra, Petra, from the Greek context, is a small rock that later became a cliff, what we call Petros. And that, uh, that is what Jesus is, say is saying. The Greek word ecclesia for church refers to a meeting of a people called out and summoned together. So that's what we call a church. A church is not a building. A church is a meeting of a people called out and summoned together. So in the New Testament, it designates primarily the congregation of God's people in Christ who come together as citizens of God's kingdom. If you look at Ephesians chapter number 2 verse 19, Ephesians 2 verse 19, so a church is not a building per se, 
but is a people called out, gathered or summoned together to listen to the word of God. Ephesians chapter number 2 verse 19 says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. That is what we are, members of God's household. And that in verse number 20, these members are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So in him, Jesus, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So, what we can say here about a church is that the church can only be a true church if it is founded on Christ-inspired infallible revelation of the New Testament apostles because the New Testament apostles were the original messengers, they were witnesses and authorized representatives of the crucified and raised Lord. They were the foundational stones or foundation stones of the church and their message is preserved in the writings of the New Testament as original fundamental testimony to the gospel of Christ valid for all times. So a church can only be a true church when it is founded on Christ-inspired, infallible revelation to the first apostles. When we, when, we, when we avoid the teachings of the first apostles, then we no longer become a true church. May God help us. So, a people are brought together, summoned together for the purpose of worshiping God. That's why we are a church. We are brought together for the purpose of worshiping God so that the word church can refer to a local church. From Matthew chapter 18 verse 17 or it can be referred to a universal church like we are reading Matthew 16 verse 18 and Acts 20 verse 28. Praise be to God. So the church is presented as the people of God. 1 Corinthians chapter two chapter 1 verse 2 first corinthians chapter 1 verse 2 a church is the people of god it's not a building i'll keep on reminding everyone of the hearers that a church is not a building in first corinthians chapter 1 verse 2 he says to the church of god in corinth who is the church to those sanctified in christ jesus and called to be holy together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Those are the people we can say they are a church. Praise be to God. A people called together. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 10 verse 32. 10 and verse number 32 on the same of who a church is 10 and verse number 32 because what I'm doing is a Bible exposition of the same. It says this, Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. When we are working as one team, a team has one mind. We don't work in the church like a group. A group has diverse spirits and opinions. We work as a team, a team of one spirit. Praise be to God. So a church, if you look at uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 4 to 10, just to do an exposition of what a church is, 1 Peter chapter number 2, chapter number 2, verse 4 to 10, possibly just to tell what a church is because many people have missed the mark of what a church is. Chapter 2, verse 4 to 10. And I read kindly, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, 
but chosen by God and precious to him. You also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house, that is a church, to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. So now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, and a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message which is also what they were destined for. Verse number 9 says, But, you know, but is an adversative noun. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. That is what we call a church. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. A church is a people that have been called out of darkness into the wonderful light. It's not a congregation of every Dick and Harry and religiously notorious. It's a congregation of believers. Remember, I've said many times, believers are those Christians committed to obey. The rest are just religious. If you are not committed to, to obey, you are not a believer. Believers are those followers of Jesus committed to obey. Praise be to God. So, verse number 10 says once, you are not a people. Yeah, when we were in darkness, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We are now a holy nation. Uh, believers are set apart from the world in order to belong completely to God and to proclaim the gospel of salvation to his glory and praise. So you can categorize yourself whether you are a believer by listening into this genuine interpretation of scripture. The company of redeemed believers is also a church, a company of redeemed believers made possible by Christ's death. In 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18 to 19, 1 Peter 1 verse 18 to 19, this is so explicit that we are a company, a company of redeemed believers made possible by Christ's death. You, you cannot have a choice who to belong to the church and who not to belong because this is a company of redeemed people, redeemed people that are made possible by Christ's death. And this is what the Bible says in verse number 18. Uh, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you are redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. You know, fathers can, can hand empty empty uh, way of life like you do not love your children enough if you have not shown them the way of God. If you, are, you have only taken them to the university and have found very good jobs for them, that is handing over empty way of life to your child. Because if it is not telling them about who God is, then what you have handed them over is empty way of life, looking for their school fees and upkeep and jobs and such kind of life. Verse number 19 says, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamp without blemish or defect, that is what a church is, praise be to God, that we have been redeemed uh, by the precious blood of Jesus 
So scripture plainly sets forth Christ's sacrificial death as that which procures a believer's redemption. That means the blood that releases us from bondage, uh, from bondage to sin. We were bondage to sin, but we have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Praise be to God. So a church is a pilgrim people no longer belonging to this earth. Hebrew chapter 13 verse 12 to 14 says we are not belonging to this church but we are moving whose first function is to stand as a community in a living personal relationship with God. That's a church. A people whose first function is to stand as a, communi a community in a living personal relationship with God. And that is what 1 Peter 2 and verse number 5 says. Praise be to God. Chapter 2, 1 Peter. Chapter 2, verse 5. Uh, may I read? A holy priesthood. This is what the Bible says. You also like living stones as being built into a spiritual house. A church is a spiritual house. It's not a carnal house. It's not a Christianized humanistic fellowship. No, it is a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. For what purpose? Offering spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So in the Old Testament, the priesthood was restricted to a qualified minority. But their distinctive activity was to offer sacrifices to God on behalf of his people and to communicate directly with God. That's what we can find in Exodus chapter 28 and verse number 1. Also in 2 Chronicles 29 verse 11. Now through Jesus Christ, every Christian has been made a priest before God. That is found in the book of Revelation. Chapter 1 verse 6 and Revelation 5 verse 10 and Revelation 20 verse, verse 6. So the priesthood of all believers means the following. Number one, if we can go to that, all believers have direct access to God through Christ. We are believers. Those guys committed to obey, they have a direct access to God through Christ. And that is what 1 Peter 3 verse number 18 says. We don't go through anyone. There is none to qualify us. It is Christ. 1 Peter 3 verse 18. This is what the Bible says. For Christ died for sins once for all. The righteous for the unrighteous. To do what? To bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. Praise be to God. So nobody is quantifying or qualifying us. It's only that we are brought very near to God through Jesus Christ. Another point on this, we can say that all believers are under obligation to live holy lives. Yes, praise the Lord. First Peter 2 verse 5 and First Peter 2 and verse number 9. And First Peter chapter 1 verse 14 and, and to verse 17. First Peter 1 verse 14. May I read 14? Uh, this is what the Bible says. As obedient children do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy. There is one who calls us. He is called holy. So be holy in all you do. Amen. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Verse 17 says, so you call on a father. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work, impartially live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. We have a one man who calls us 
and he is holy. So he's telling us to live holy lives. This is why we cannot follow any doctrine from man. A church becomes a cult when the ultimate authority is a person. Our ultimate authority is the word of God, is the Bible and not a personality. Praise be to God. So the church is a people called out. This is why the Greek says ecclesia, called out of the world and into God's kingdom. Separation from the world is inherent to the church's nature and is rewarded by having the Lord as one's God, as one's Father. You know, it is important to, to learn about um, the Trinity, one God functioning in three, uh, uh, in three areas. We have one God who is the Father invisible. He manifests himself in the Son and operates in the Holy Spirit. So Trinity is like water can be water. It can be liquid and still be water. Water can be solid and still be water. Water can be steam and still be water. That is the Trinity. So this God has called us out. Out of the world into God's kingdom. Separating us from everything that is of the world. What is the world? The world is... From the Greek word cosmos, which means a vast system of the devil where Satan dominates independent of God. So we come from the dominance of Satan because the world is cosmos, a vast system where Satan dominates independent of God. God created the heavens and the earth. He did not create the world. The world was created by Satan, that system. So we are told to come out of that system of the devil. Praise be to God. So the church is the temple of God and the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible says. In 1 Corinthians, you know, Corinthians um, were gymnastics. That is where the first universities, universities were found. And uh, those guys were so learned. They were the Greek philosophers. And there's something they didn't understand. When Paul came, he asked them in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and, and verse number 16. You find Paul is asking them a question. Don't you know that you, are, you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you. So the church is the temple of God and the Holy Spirit. This truth about the church demands separation from unrighteousness and from worldly immorality. If we must belong to a church, we must have this truth. Separation from unrighteousness and separation from worldly immorality if we have to be a church. Praise be to God. And this is why now Paul is asking these guys whether they don't understand that they are God's temple. The emphasis here is on the entire congregation of believers that we must understand we as believers, we are God's temple and the Holy Spirit dwells in us. So we must separate ourselves from unrighteousness and worldly immorality. The church is the body of Christ. Body of Christ, me, me and you. And this image indicates that no true church exists apart from vital union of the members with Christ. The head of the body is Christ. So we as members must have vital union with Christ. Praise be to God. In Ephesians 1 verse 22, 
about vital union with Christ. There are guys who do not have union with Christ. They have union with themselves. And they think that is what we call a church. It must be union with Christ and not union with themselves. The Bible says, And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church. So if we, are, we don't have a vital union with Christ, we are not a church. This is not a family issue of carnality. It's not a Christianized humanistic fellowship. It's a spiritual fellowship of those people who have, uh, who have uh, left unrighteousness. They are separated from unrighteousness and from worldly immorality. May God help us. So we can say that the church is an image of marriage that emphasizes a devotion and faithfulness of the church of Christ. Just like there is a union in marriage that Jesus died for the church, so is the physical church as well as Christ's love for the church and has intimacy with the church. Intimacy. The church is a spiritual fellowship. The Greek says koinonia. is a spiritual fellowship. And this involves the indwelling of the spirit. When you are indwelt with the spirit, I'm indwelt in the spirit. So we can have a spiritual fellowship. The unity of the spirit that's recorded in Ephesians chapter number 4. That is what we call the church bestowed by the Holy Spirit. If there is the absence of the Holy Spirit, then that is not a church. It's a congregation that has a deficiency of an essential commodity, union with Christ. So when we talk about a church, it's a spiritual ministry. A church is a spiritual ministry. It serves through the use of gifts bestowed by the Holy Spirit. A spiritual ministry is very important. I would love to have you with a spiritual ministry as I have a spiritual ministry and gift. Your gift is a blessing to me. My gift is a blessing to you. No intimidation, no manipulation. We are not in a competition, but we are compl complimenting one another. Praise be to God. So, the church is also an army involved in spiritual conflict. An army must be, must have one mind, must have one leader. The military has this language, obey the captain. The first rule is obey the captain. The second rule is obey the captain. And the third rule is obey the captain. And the fourth rule in an event that the captain is wrong, remember the first rule, obey the captain. So our captain is Jesus Christ. We obey Jesus Christ. And there is no occasion that he can be wrong. May God help us. So the church is an army. It fights by the sword and the power of the spirit. We do not ha have kind of fights. Yeah? Uh, like when a pastor has... Uh, a deacon board you would have some people with a demon board fighting carnally but here we must fight by the sword and the power of the spirit Ephesians 6 verse 17 so the church is in a spiritual struggle against Satan and against all the dominion of the devil the church must be filled like a warrior welding living word of God. Yeah? Yielding and welding the word of God. The army must have like they have swords and ammunition. We must have the word of God. The living word of God. You know Romans chapter 12 and verse, verse number 2. I love the Romans because it's the Magna Carta. 
Magna Carta says is the document of Christian liberty. Romans is the purest gospel, is the Christian manifesto. What verse two, chapter 12 says in the book of Romans, uh, and I love it so much, it says this, chapter 12, and verse number 1, it says, uh, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. So the word of God must be living, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. This is very serious. That we need to understand our spiritual act of worship is to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. So when we are an army, we must have the living word of God delivering people from Satan's dominion and conquering every power of this dark world. Praise be to God. So the church is a pillar and ground of truth. It is quite a big shame the way we find a church today presenting itself. A church is a pillar and ground of truth. First Timothy chapter 3 verse 15. A pillar and ground of truth. Pillar and ground of truth. This is what the Bible says in First Timothy 3 verse 15. If I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. Brothers, the church must be the foundation of the truth of the gospel. It upholds and preserves the truth revealed by Christ and the apostles by receiving and obeying it. These are very scaring words. Hiding it, that truth in the heart. Praise be to God. Just like Psalms 119 verse 11 says, I'll hide your word so that I may not sin. Proclaiming it as the word of life. Philippians 2 verse 16. Defending it. Philippians 1 verse 16. And demonstrating its power in the Holy Spirit. So, when those guys who run the church are minus the Holy Spirit, they can do exploits in the negative. They can do dramas. May God help us to understand the church is a pillar and ground of truth. Supporting the truth as a foundation supports a building. A church should support the truth as the foundation supports a building. It must uphold the truth and keep it safe, defending it against distorters, diverters, and those who dilute the gospel and against false teachers. May God help us. The church is a people with a future hope. That church of Christ is a people with a future hope. This hope centers in Christ's return for his people. This is why every time I finish speaking to you, I talk about Christocentric views. Praise be to God. The church is a people with a future hope. The church is both invisible and visible. The church invisible is the body of true believers united by their living faith in Christ. This is why I love being in Christian living in faith eternally church. It is important that we believers be united by living in faith in Christ. And the visible church consists of 
local congregation containing faithful overcomers a church of a local congregation consisting of faithful overcomers people who have hope for the future praise be to god as well as for those professed christians who are false they also belong to the church the fallen and the spiritually dead this is why we have even the lukewarm in revelation 3 verse 16 I want you to note that unless they change, just belonging to that congregation will not make them go to heaven because Jesus will come and separate the wicked from the faithful. May God help us. I am Dr. David Jeroga Evans, Bishop, Christian Life Church Thicker. I welcome you to continue listening to Christocentric Views genuine content. God bless you. Amen. Amen.